Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. One. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us here for another episode. As always, wherever in the world you're listening to us from, whatever platform you're listening to us on, thank you guys so much for the support, the kind messages, emails, tweets, all that great stuff that you have sent the show's way. As always, keep those things coming. I really do appreciate all of it and and love hearing from you guys. And I'm really excited to bring this one to you today. We're going to talk about shooting today. We're going to talk about uh, building shooters and the idea of getting your shooters kind of to that next level and how you can make sure that your shooters are getting quality shots up, how you can evaluate where your players are at, work with them to get them the best shots that they possibly can, and really all like the little ins and outs and nuances that go into making sure that uh, shooters are ready come game time and and, and they've put in the work beforehand and and they feel confident when it's time to knock those shots down. So that's what we're going to jump into today. Of course, I don't do this alone. Very happy to be joined by my guest today. Coach John Stockton is here joining us today. Coach, really appreciate you being able to come on and, and talk to us today. How are things going? Things are going great. Thanks for having me, and I'm looking uh, looking forward to talking about some shooting today. Love it, Coach. Let's start with you and your basketball journey and your coaching journey. Walk us through <laughs> and talk us through uh, where this great game of basketball has taken you and where it is that you're at right now. Sure, absolutely. Um So I'm originally from uh, Middlesex, New Jersey, grew up there, uh, fell in love with basketball pretty much at the age of five, obviously with my name, uh, John Stockton, uh, watching a lot of Utah jazz games (laughs) in New Jersey wasn't the most common thing that a kid in in the early nineties was doing, but that was what I was doing. And uh, I was probably the only kid uh, this side of Salt Lake City that was wearing a Utah Jazz jersey instead of a Chicago Bulls number 20 <laughs> jersey. Um, <clears throat> but really from then on, I, I had a passion for the game and I was lucky enough to be a pretty good player myself. Um, I was a good high school player at Middlesex High School. Was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go play uh, Division II Juco ball at Raritan Valley Community College. Um where I was pretty successful for two years. We had a, we a complete rebuild of that program. Uh, my first year, we were a three win team by my sophomore year. We were a 13, 14 win team. If I remember correctly, made the playoffs in our league for the first time. And I believe it was 25 years. Um, so I was really proud of, uh, of the accomplishments as a player there. And then my final two years were, I came up to Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a D3, NCAA D3 school, um, where I finished out my career, played with a lot of good players. I had four teammates that ended up playing uh, at the professional level. Uh, So we had some good talent there. And uh, even during my my time at Lesley, uh, my college coach, Donald Morris, had talked to me about you know, coaching. And that's probably where my future is in the game. And uh, after my playing career, I was uh, pretty much a volunteer assistant at Leslie, um, where I had a a great experience and learned a lot uh, as a first year coach. Um, But after that, I kind of realized that the high school game was where I wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, I send in a resume, uh, to a school to be a varsity coach with really no prior experience. So that wasn't going to likely happen. I was lucky enough to catch on with, uh, my mentor, Mike Norman, who got the varsity job at Lincoln Sudbury regional high school in Sudbury, Massachusetts. Um, I was with him for the last nine years as a, an assistant, led to being a JV head coach, which then led to being the associate head coach in Sudbury. Um, And then he moved on to Ashland High School. I moved on with him. Uh, I was a JV coach there for three years. And then uh, this past September, I was lucky enough to finally get my opportunity as a head coach at Algonquin Regional High School in Northborough, Massachusetts. Um, And that's that's kind of where we're at now. And, you know, the game has, has given me a lot of, opportunity and a lot of 
uh, things that I'm grateful for. And I hope to pass on a lot of information to the, the younger generation coming, coming up and coming forward. So that's, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. No, I pre appreciate you sharing that a lot, a lot of, uh, real good stuff there. A lot of experience, a lot of variety in the things that you've been involved in. So that, that that's really, that's really great. Uh, I wanted to talk to you, uh, real quick before we started about, uh, the, the, the idea of building shooters about one of the things I know that, that you have a passion for is just the process of, of, of interviews and the process of the job interview itself. And so again, this is kind of perfect that this kind of comes out here in the, in, in the off season here in the summer. So I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give to coaches uh, to, to interview well? And, and what questions do you think they should be asking in an interview to make sure that the position is right for them? What, what, what advice would you give for those coaches going through that interview process right now? Sure. I, th I think it's a, it's kind of a twofold question because if you're a, if you're a young coach in mm -hmm. your twenties who, who wants to be a head coach, I'm going to tell you that it, it's a hard process at any level, college, high school, when you're young with a lack of experience, it's a it's a hard, hard thing to get a varsity job or to get a, a college job just because of your age. But I think what's very important <clears throat> is that you shouldn't not apply to jobs and you should take interviews to jobs that even, you know, like you're not going to get it. You've heard like some great coach is going to come and take this program over. If you get an opportunity to interview take it, get the experience, hear the questions. Um, my first interview ever, uh, little high school out in central Massachusetts. I knew I wouldn't get the job. It was my first interview. And all I did was write down the questions that they were going to ask me because I had no experience of what, what they're looking for. What kind of questions are they going to ask me? I, you know, every coach is going to do a Google search of what, what questions will be asked to hear the questions and then to figure out after what are good answers is so important. Go in there, learn the questions and then say, okay, this is what I have to build on. There's also a lot of rejection in this process. You know, I've yeah. been, I've gone to many job interviews where you think you get the job and all oh, this went great. You start calling people. Would you want to be on the staff? Would you want this? Then you get the phone call of thanks, but no thanks. I think the, if there's any athletic directors listening to this, please stop with the, we think you're great. You're going to be a great coach, but it's not, it's not your time. Just, just rip the bandaid off. Cause I I've heard it so many times of like, you're great. You were, we really think you're going to be a great coach. Please just, just rip the bandaid off. We don't need to hear that. We're, we're awesome at the things we have a passion for. Um, once you get into that, once you get to a point where, you feel like I'm at the point where I'm going to get a varsity job. I have some experience, have your philosophy, whatever it is. You know, I I've said you, you can look at Mike Krzyzewski. You can look at Jim Boeheim. You can look at John Calipari. All guys have won national championships, all did it a different way. There's no perfect offense, defense, pressing philosophy, but whatever your philosophy is, make sure you, you can talk about it, defend it, give reasons why this is your philosophy, why you think it works, what your offense is, why you think it works, why it's going to be successful, why it makes the players in your future program be successful. Because I, we've all seen different philosophies win on the offense and defensive end, but make sure you have that philosophy and whatever, whatever it is. If your philosophy is 2-3 zone, you talk about 2-3 zone and why it's the best defense known to man. Don't, don't ever take your philosophy and think, eh, it's not as good as this philosophy. You have to be able to defend what you believe in. Um, and that's all, that's not just offense and defense. That's what you do in the off season. Uh, that's what, how you're going to run practices, always be able to defend what you're talking about. Cause when, when athletic directors see that confidence, they start to think of you as a real serious candidate. That's, uh, some of the info I would give younger coaches who are um, looking to be head coaches. And for older coaches, mm -hmm. I would say you, you really have to look into the new age of the game. Doing mic and drills nowadays, kids are just going to get bored of that. Nobody wants to hear about it as much as I think it's a good drill. But for older coaches, I would recommend looking into the new phase of the game and, and also look at the new phase of 
amateur athletics, youth athletics, because it's changed. I mean, the days of yelling and screaming, this generation hasn't really done well with yellers and screamers. I've seen more and more coaches getting fired because of, you know, yelling and screaming and, and parents complaining about that, uh, that type of style. So really look into how, how things are done nowadays. Um, because I think that there's definitely athletic directors that are looking to go into this new age of, of coaching and not being, you know, so much of, uh, yellers and screamers and more of people that can talk and, and communicate with kids effectively that aren't yelling and screaming. It's funny you mentioned that last part about, you know, keeping up with the the new age of of of, of players and the new age of 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 the way that coaching is done, the way that programs are run. I know that uh, you know, I, I was talking actually to an athletic director not too long ago who mentioned, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure, like with one of our our sports programs, is that, you know, they have uh, you know, a, a social media presence and that, you know, are posting highlights and advertising things. And and when he interviews people and they they seem like they don't want to do it or they don't have any interest in it or don't want to get involved in that, like that's a that's a big red flag to them. So just, just hearing that was kind of a reminder of like, you know, wanting to stay current and stay up to date of, of what, you know, it, it is to run a program program and, and, and have that visibility and what that sort of looks like. It's, it's interesting how, uh, you know, the, the, those things are always changing and evolving. Yeah. I mean, the social media aspect of it nowadays, um, a lot of different coaches do it different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a couple coaches that they run every single social media and they uh, they're sticklers about it and they, they tweet out a million things a day. And other coaches, you know, they they've given their players some flexibility with it. I know uh, our team uh, Instagram account. I allow the the uh, our captains to run it, uh, so they have some some sort of uh, responsibilities on game days. You know, get a picture out, show everybody that we have a game tonight. Nothing, but as as I tell them, it can't be anything else. I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, what what party is going on or what political <laughs> affiliation somebody has it's all basketball in our program and that's yeah. a good teaching method for kids these days because everything's on the internet so uh, it just gives them a little bit more of a responsibility but uh, social media is a big big part of youth and high school athletics nowadays even college athletics yeah. And to that point, anything that, that can get our players to uh, practice and learn about like good social media habits, definitely going to help them in the future <laughs> with Absolutely. what they pass and everything. All right, coach, let me, let me, let me ask you about, as we move into the topic of building shooters, let, let's start with just the, the concept of, of building uh, a shooter. And, and, and when players come to you and uh, you're, you're working on improving their shooting, what, what's the, what's kind of the process that you go through of kind of evaluating where their shot is at and then sort of figuring out a plan to kind of maximize their, their potential as a, as a shooter. Sure. So I'll, I'll kind of go a little bit backwards with it. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go from high school to, to elementary school. Cool. Uh, we'll go in that, uh, in that way. Um, for my high school kids, uh, you know, this year was my first year at Algonquin Regional High School. So I had to get to know the kids and where their skill level was at. Luckily, nowadays, everything is either on YouTube or Huddle or some sort of, you know, film account that you can watch kids, kids play and participate in, in athletics. So when I got the job, I and even before I got the job, I watched a lot of film and I, you know, take a lot of notes of what can certain guys do. Um, once I got the the last season's roster and I was able to see which kids would be coming back, you know, you look into it and you evaluate kind of like a scouting report. I was doing it as like, how would I scout this team? And then you look at personnel and who can shoot and, you know, who, where guys can shoot and where's their range at. Uh, so that was really the first thing I did. And then once I got the job, it's sitting down and kind of talking with them. This is what I notice. I noticed that from 15 feet in, you're you're a pretty good shooter. Anything outside of that, you're you're not where you need to be. And then we make a plan of we got to get, you know, 500 shots up from 16 feet out and you got to work on that and rep it out every day to really develop shooting. Shooting, you know, it's the old adage of shooters are made, rebounders are born. And I think yeah, that, that every great shooter, even 
you know, there was an article or an interview with Anthony Edwards of the Minnesota Timberwolves, and they talked to him about, you know, how how are you shooting the ball so well in these playoffs? And he goes, well, also, when I came into the league, I wasn't a good shooter. So my summers were shoot making 2,000 shots a day. Now, we have players that don't shoot 2,000 shots the entire summer. <laughs> so, you know, it's it, to be a better shooter, you have to work at it. And you have to work at, one, the things that you're good at. So if you're a great mid-range shooter, you have to continue working on that. And if you're a subpar three-point shooter, now the summer's where you have to rep it out. For every good shot that you take in the summer when you're working on it, you got to take four or five of the tougher shots, the shots that you struggle with. I have a post player right now who, you know, as at the high school level, post player is probably six, six, two and a half. And I've told him, like, if you want to play at the, the next level, which I think he's has the skill set to do, you have to move out to the three point line. So he's somebody when we sit down, it's you got to be taking maybe 200 threes from each spot on the court this summer to really work on making shots and, and making the open shots first. And that's just standstill. We're not even talking about dribble moves or anything yet. Stationary shooting is where I think you have to start at any age level. I see too many yeah. kids nowadays who want to shoot off the dribble, take seven dribbles, and then shoot a fadeaway shot because they saw Luka Doncic do that. <laughs> what they don't see is when Luka Doncic is in the summer and he's just on a shooting machine catching and shooting, not moving. I think it's it's that's the basic level of shooting, catch and shoot. Catch and shoot, it's the only thing you have to worry about. It's like in teaching, if you're teaching math, you're going to teach adding before multiplication. So you need to do this, the, the easy things first. So catching and shooting is where we go first. Don't worry about anything else but putting the ball in the hoop. When you can do that 80% of the time, let, then we can start talking about dribble moves and all right, take two dribbles, pull up here. We'll get to that after you're a, a good catch and shoot guy. I don't think I've ever seen a shooter who is a great two dribble shooter, take two dribbles and shoot it before he was a good catch and shoot guy. So that's yeah, really yeah, the part yeah. is, is catching and shooting. Um, and then we worry about all the dribble move stuff after, but in the summer, I, I give everyone, when we met after the season, I gave every one of my players, I told them all, you have to be better shooters. Every one of them, even the good shooters. And when they, the good ones will ask you like, well, what does that look like? And to me, it's always repetition and making sure you're working on things that you're not strong at at the moment. If you don't come into a summer with a plan of how you're going to be a better basketball player, not only just a shooter, but as a basketball player, you're not going to improve. So when we sit down and we make a plan with our guys, they should know what is a good shot for them currently and what's not a good shot. And I want them to work on the things that aren't good shots because that's the only way they improve. If they don't work on the things that they aren't good at, they're not going to improve. So we, we talk about at length what's a good shot for you currently and what should be a good shot for you when you come back the Monday after Thanksgiving when tryouts start. So that's, that's what we do with our, how we build shooters at the high school level. With the, the middle schoolers, elementary school level, Mm -hmm. Yeah, we start, we start catch and shoot. I don't, we start catch and shoot and all in the mid range. I think we in America, especially we want to go out to that three point line way too quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. You have third grade AAU teams who are shooting 43s a game because that's what Steph Curry does. But these kids don't have good form. They're not using their legs. They're just yeah. putting the ball just as far it. Yeah. back as they can with their shoulders and throwing it at the yeah. rim. And hopefully right. it goes in and they think they're a good shooter. But when they get to the high school level and they have bad form, next thing you know, they're getting their shot blocked because of the release is too, too slow. Um, so with our elementary school and our middle school, it's a lot of form shooting. It's a lot of stand underneath the basket. And with the third, really third through sixth grade and anything younger, we, we have to move the baskets down so they can work on form shooting. Uh, but that's what they do in Europe. And that's why Europe is bringing out all these highly skilled players and winning 
MVPs in in the NBA now because they are so highly skilled and they practice a lot more. So with our younger guys, we are we're a lot of form shooting, uh, a lot of free throws. I think free throws is the best way to really develop shooting at the young at the younger levels, just because one, it's a very important shot, and for a lot of elementary school students, that should really be the farthest shot they take is a free throw. Anything else is it's just too far. Third through fifth graders especially aren't going to be able to reach a three point shot unless they develop so early. And then that's, that's even more of an issue. Um, but really if form shooting, getting their understanding what a good shot looks like using their legs. I don't think a lot of young players use their legs appropriately uh, to get their shot. Everyone thinks their shot is all upper body, but really your shot starts with your feet. So your feet got to be parallel and you got to get good lift on your shot. Those are things that we, we, it's called the jump shot for a reason, right? You're supposed to jump mm-hmm. when you shoot. So, and <laughs> yeah. that, I, I reference that all the time with my high school stu- uh, players too, because a lot of them don't elevate on their shot. Cause again, it's not something that's talked about. We talk about it, elevate, get off the ground, shoot the ball on the way up, not on the way down. Um, all, or all sorts of things that we'll do with our, our youth, youth teams, especially. And my hope, you know, I'm, it's, it's only year one, but my hope is that we see a huge leap going forward with our shooting because we are teaching the kids the correct way to do it and not looking for instant gratification with three-pointers and 40-foot jump shots. No, we're going to develop it inside out, and eventually you're going to see uh, a program that has 13 great shooters on their roster. When you're explaining this process, when you're when you're talking about the the concept of kind of pulling things back a bit, you know, go go starting, you know, with 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 the form shooting and and making sure that the technique and the fundamentals and everything is, is correct, are are players are they are they bought in are are they bought in right away or are, are are they able to stay focused are they able to like understand the rationale and everything behind it is there a lot of teaching or explanation that you have to give to them as to why this is the way things need to be done what what what's that process been like yeah I, especially with younger younger kids are actually a little bit easier to work mm-hmm. with on this because they want to be able to sh- to shoot that shot they want to be able to shoot like their idols of Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and all those great shooters. And I always bring it back to Steph Curry does, he finishes off every one of his shooting drills with making 10, not only making, but swishing 10 free throws. And I I say to great high school shooters all the time, it's hard to do that after you've just done a, a, a whole workout. Um, but that's something that he always does. But, you have to think about free throws are just uh, mentally is such a mental part of the game that to make not to swish 10 in a row at an end when you're tired, it all comes back to your fundamentals, making sure that everything's lined up, right. Making sure you're squared to the basket, making sure that your form is correct. And when you bring it back to their idols, younger kids are like, Oh, okay. I want to try that. I want to do that. And they're, they're more, I, I, I would say, bought in right away because they want to be good. They want to be the just like school, them, yeah. The high school players, they want to be cool. So they'll be like, why are we doing form shooting when, like, I can make a jump shot? And I've, I've had players say that. And to me, it's like the, the pros all do it. The great college programs do it. They're all going to work on form shooting. And – if you don't buy in, you're going to get passed. That's how I bring it to high school uh, high school players. If you're not willing to do it, somebody else will, and they're going to see the benefits. And that might cost you a starting spot, might cost you a rotational spot, or it might cost you a spot altogether because other guys are improving and you're not because you want to be cool. And, you know, we try to do a lot of form shooting stuff that is fun and a lot of competitions to it. Um, you know, who, who has the best shooting percentage after 50 form shots. We do things like that. We try to keep it competitive. So, because obviously everybody wants to win. Um, so we kind of do that with our high school kids. Uh, 
even just regular shooting drills, we, we are very competitive with it uh, because <clears throat> shooting, especially you, if you get into a shooting slump, you get very yeah. in your head uh, with the competition aspect. First of all, you always have a teammate most of the time and uh, you have guys that can lean on you and give a positive outlook to it when things aren't going well. And sometimes it's even, I'm not shooting well. We got to get him more shots. So we got to, you know, work on our quick release, get a rebound, throw it to him so he can, he, we can ride him for a second. But um, we do, we do a lot with it. And it, the motivational aspect to it is, is huge because it is such, it's a part of the game that you don't see on a day-to-day basis. Nobody does form shooting when the clock is running. So it's it's just one of those fundamental pieces you have to work on to be a better shooter. Um, and the guys that will buy into that are going to be the guys that make the leaps and and get those opportunities in game and possibly get opportunities to play at the collegiate level because they have worked at it. The guys that don't work at it, the guys that want to be cool, they'll get passed up. Yeah, and and it's it's really interesting to – I'm sure you've had this before too. Like you see guys who once they're putting in that, that work on form shooting or the, the fundamentals, the things that, you know, uh, may, may not be as cool looking as you said, once they start to see like, Oh, this is actually helping my shot. I'm actually making a lot more. Yeah, that, once that, that, that <clears throat> moment kind of clicks, I found like then players like, Oh, I totally get it. I'm good. And then the ones who were resistant the whole time, those are the ones that fall behind really quickly. And then they, the two of them definitely separate themselves. The ones who, who, who see it and put it through and the ones who are resistant because of the way that it looks. Yeah. I mean, I had a, I had a kid when I was at Lincoln Sudbury who, he was an undersized post player. He had a, you know, he had a kind of weird looking shot. Uh, he would make a couple here and there. And after his junior year, and he was going to be a, uh, a big part of our program going forward. You know, I, I told him you need to work on just the, the fundamentals of shooting and you'll be a pretty good shooter. And he was, you know, one of those kids that put in the work and next thing you know, he's a league all-star as a senior as an undersized center, you know, he was, just, I, I say he was five, five, 10. He's probably closer mm-hmm. to six, two. It just sounds better when I say he was five, 10, <laughs> but he, uh, he put the work in and was able to be more of that stretch four that we needed. And because of it, we, you know, we won a game in a state tournament and, you know, he had a lot of success that year just because of little things that he did with his form. And he did all that in the summer, you know, the summertime, you get nine, you know, six months really to work in the summer. And, you know, he, he's a kid that did, did it the right way and it worked out for him. And there's plenty of kids I've had that didn't. (laughs) When it comes to a guy who has a shot that has, you know, a little bit of a, a kink to it or the, you know, they're, they're a good shooter, but they're, there's something, whether it's like their, their arm or, or, or their footwork or some, something a little hitch or something. When you, when you have a guy who's got <clears throat> something like that, that needs to be fixed. Um, what, what is your approach of trying to make sure that you can like make that adjustment for them without having them get completely in their head about their whole entire shot? How do you kind of go about making like those small adjustments and, and, and tweaking a guy's shot just a bit? So it's, it's very hard to do in season. So yes, I've, kind I of, that, yeah. I, I've kind of gotten away with trying to fix kids shots in season. That's one of those things that we talk about in meetings about, this is what you need to improve on. Um, I had another player a couple of years ago who he had a pretty, he was a good shooter, very good shooter. Um, but he had a little bit of a hitch off the catch. He would catch and he would hitch it a little bit. And it was causing him when he got to the varsity level where guys were able to contest his shot a little bit quicker. He was getting his shot blocked. Um, And when he asked like, what's going on with my shot? We, we sat down and watched film and I, I was able to show him like specific instances where you see off the catch, how you're kind of hitching it when you go into your shot and that's forcing one to two seconds off your shot, which allows the defender to get back there, which is causing you to miss shots because they are able to get there. So in the season, once the season ended, we told him you got to work on 
catching and just one motion on your shot. And that was a lot of repetition of getting in the gym and throwing him a lot of passes and catching and shooting. And anytime he did it the wrong way, we had to restart and do it again. Um, so that that's one specific instance where we saw some improvement because the next year he was able to shoot it a little bit better. Um, there's also been instances where we've had to completely change a kid's shot where, you know, his elbows out too far. Um, you know, his, his shots too far behind his head. And that comes back to form shooting. A lot of times is just working on it the right way. Um, working on, you know, creating the L with your arm and finishing as an eye, good follow through everything, uh, like that. And, uh, that was another kid that worked pretty well and worked hard on creating a new shot in the summer. Um, but really that's really the only time you have to work on completely work, uh, redoing a kid's shot because you know, in season, you just, there's so much you have to do in season. I wish we could just worry about shooting in season. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? It would be, especially, especially in Massachusetts because Massachusetts were not, we're not allowed to do team workouts um, because right? of the rules. So we're not allowed to really work out with kids in the summer unless we have other teams involved or we're at camp. So it makes it hard uh, to get like full group workouts in, but um, yeah, in season, it's just, it's just too hard. I've tried it before. It's not something. It, and even for the kid, if you're redoing your shot and now you're asking them to go into the game and hit two or three threes, or make a couple mid range jumpers. It's it's too hard. It's not going to work out well, and it's only going to make the team suffer. So, any individual stuff like that has to be done uh, after the season in the summer when you have more time to get things done. Yeah, 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 for sure. And and especially to the example that you gave about trying to fundamentally change somebody's shot, uh, I, I I think I tried to do that once, and I. I, I did. I think I tried to do that one time. And honestly, coach, uh, she just like stopped shooting like the rest of the season. She was so in her head trying to fix everything. Yeah. She would get wide open looks and she would just freeze because I think mentally she was like trying to literally remember everything that we had just talked about. And it was it was way too much. And I was like, all right, yeah, I, I can't do that. She's she's already got enough going on. And, and me trying to completely redo her shot just completely took her out of out of her game entirely. And, it, it, and we kind of suffered for it. Yeah, they don't have any confidence. They don't have any confidence when when that stuff happens because one, they're hearing that their coach thinks that their shot is is affecting their game, and now they that's the first confidence. Like, oh, coach doesn't think I'm I'm good at this, so that's going to hurt my playing time. And then two, they get there in their head mentally of like, I can't shoot at all now because if I do, one, my form's going to be bad, and two, I have no confidence I'm going to make the shot. So I, I can see it where somebody would just say, I'm just not going to shoot. I'll be a facilitator. I'll shoot layups. And that just only hurt, hurts your team going forward. Yeah. And then for her case, I'm, I'm sure one of the things she was also worried is about just like shooting and, and going back to her old form. Cause that's just what was come naturally. It's like, Oh, I don't want to do that. And so it was not shoot entirely. Yeah. So, so the off season's big on that. You mentioned how you like to, uh, as you kind of work in on, on shooting and, and do some competitions and, and, and things like that to kind of keep, keep the guys engaged and keep them competing with each other. Are there certain like shooting drills or shooting competitions that you, that you found effective? Uh, we do a seven spot shooting drill. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, we, we split them up into, you know, even teams as much as we can. Uh, sometimes we do uh, first team versus second team. Sometimes we do upperclassmen versus uh, underclassmen, depending on how the, uh, layout of the team looks on a year to year basis. And then you're just going seven spots. It's really 14 spots. Cause I make them do it in the mid range. And then at the three point line. Um, and they're just, they're making seven shots as a group. Once they make seven at one spot, they go to the three point line. Then they go to the next mid range spot. I like the way I do it because one, you don't just get to shoot three pointers in the game you do have to shoot mid range. You have to shoot at different spots and you have to effectively change how you shoot from when you're shooting a three pointer versus when you're shooting a 12 footer. So they see a lot of repetition of, I just shot threes. Now I have to go shoot mid ranges. So they get a little bit of muscle memory going on that with their shot. Loser always runs in that drill. Another drill we do, it's more of a team 
team drill, I call it uh, 50, uh, 50 and four. So they have to make 53 pointers in four minutes. We start the drill. It's on uh, either side, right side of the floor. There's a, a guy in the middle of uh, underneath the basket who gets a rebound. They throw the outlet pass. They sprint to the opposite three-point line. They get a pass, shoot. It's a continuous drill. Um, and after four minutes, if they don't get 50, we go on to the next side. So the, the left side, they do it again. And if they are able to get up to 100 in that eight minutes combined, they successfully do it as a team. If not, there's some sort of punishment. Um, we started – I. We started this year where uh, we were getting consistently like 65 to 70 in the in the uh, eight minutes. Uh, by the end of the season, we were shooting closer to the 110s to 115 range. I think the most we ever got was 120. Um, and one, it's just a good team builder. They're all rooting for each other. There's no there's no teams. It's just them as a group uh, playing against the clock, which in basketball happens all the time. We're playing against the clock in end of games a lot of times, but uh, those are two of my favorite drills that we, we tend to do on a day-to-day -day basis. When you are in a, a, a season uh, situation and you're, you're designing your offense and you're putting in your offense and you're implementing your offense, how do you kind of work uh, where does shooting work in on, on your offensive philosophy? As, as, talk us through what you like to run offensively, uh, where the shooters are, are going to get their looks at and, and how they kind of work into the offense that you run. Sure. Uh, so I'm a big one, four guy. I like with a one, four high. I think it just spaces the floor out and the way the game's going now, every kid wants to shoot. Every kid wants to play on the perimeter. So you know, nobody wants to be the the Shaquille O'Neal. Let's throw it inside and be big. Everyone wants to play on the perimeter. So I think the one four gives everybody that sort of access. Off the one four, I really like uh, Iverson Iverson cuts, um, where guys are coming up, the wings are coming up towards uh, the top of the key where they can catch the ball and play off it. I had a couple of quick guards that were able to get to the rim off of those. But one of our plays, we call it NYC. The first Iverson screen that comes up, he's coming up. We throw it to him. The opposite guard goes down uh, running baseline, comes off for two, two screens from our post guys, should get the ball at the top of the key for a three. We got a lot of good looks off of that. Main reason I ran that this year was because when I've looked at our film, we are not a great corner shooting team. Mm -hmm. So all of our shooters I had to put at the top of the key to the wing area. So that's that's why we kind of put NYC in this year, uh, just to give us top of the key looks for threes, just because I, I would say we probably shot 20% from the corners this year. As really? much as it's a very popular shot, it's just not where our strength was. Our strength was at the top of the key. Uh, we ran a couple of out of bounds plays uh, that did similar things. Uh, one in particular, uh, our play Marquette, Marquette University runs it, throw it out to one of the big guys out far. They come on, it's off of a one, four set as well. The ball side, big guy, uh, sorry, opposite side, big guy goes out to the three point line. We throw it out there. The ball side, big guy sets the screen for the, uh, guy who threw the ball in and he's getting the top of the key three off that. Um, it got us a lot of good looks. It also got the, um, the screener, a lot of good looks off of the, off of the screen because he could just duck in for a layup. Um, and those are the two main looks on that play. Uh, but again, uh, you have to look, when you look into your offense, you have to know what your team's good at. Right. And we were good at, layups with our post guys and top of the key three point shots with our shooters. So most of my offense was layups and three pointers this year. We didn't shoot a lot in the mid range. It just wasn't where guys were comfortable and we didn't shoot in the corners because guys, we shot a lot of air balls in the corners this year. So uh, when you sit down and look at what type of team you have, 
that's how you have to structure your offense. Eventually, if you do it the right way and you get your youth programs into running the same stuff that you're running, and then you can have a more, more concrete offense on a year to year basis. That's great. But especially year one, year one, year two, you're going to have to look into what are the strengths of this team and how are we going to get those guys open and look and easy looks uh, to make it successful. You can't just, you know, if you don't have a good big guy, there's no use running a one, four, uh, uh, four out one in offense. Right. If you don't have a, if you don't have a card, it's useless to run a pick and roll offense. So you have to really look at what your strength of your team is. Uh, and, and for and us, bringing, like I said, a lot of guys back to keep... to... Oh, sorry. I was going to say, and you're bringing a lot of, a lot of guys back. So are you going to, are you staying with that as the top of the key in the layups or is it going to expand at all as you kind of work in the off season? How do you kind of see your offense We're, kind of continue my, to go? My hope is to expand just because we, we talked about what our weaknesses are. So mm -hmm. we should be able to run similar things, but we should be a team that comes back being able to hit shots in the mid range and hit sh shots in the corner. So then we can evolve our offense a little bit. Um, I'll be the first to admit, I think our offense was at times easy to scout because of the, of the type of off of offensive players we had. And guys know that I'm very honest with that. We couldn't do certain things last year, this year going forward, we should be able to do this. No problem. And that will only evolve our offense and make us a harder team to guard and play against. Um, but I will still run similar things because I think some uh, the, the plays we did run got us some good looks, but there will be more. So if my players are listening to this, uh, get ready to run some different stuff as well. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Try, need to get more shots up too. get, get used to different angles. Maybe, maybe work Absolutely. on that corner for you too. Right. Hey, and yeah, that'd be also get some exactly. corner for you. <laughs> um, yeah. what is, and I, and I, I want to make sure that I, I, I give a, give a kind of a platform to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, the mental side of thing is as guys as guys are getting shots up, especially during the season, slumps happen, streaks, cold streaks happen, guys, you know, get out of rhythm or they kind of lose confidence in their ability to shoot. And I wanted to ask you about when, when those things occur and when those things are happening, how do you get a player to have that strong, positive shooters mentality to make sure that they keep shooting, they keep their head up there. They're not losing confidence, even if they're going for a bit of a tough stretch. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it's player to player, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. I, I've had players that you do have to get in their face and yell at them, and, and they play better through that. And there's also the guys that need you to put your arm around them and tell them that, you know, it, it, you're going to make the next one. You know, you're a great shooter, all, a lot of positive reinforcement there. Um, I had a player this year, he was a, a starter who went through a very bad slam was one of our better shooters. Um, and I, I told him there, there was a couple of reasons for the, the slump one. He had a very good first four games of the year. He was probably averaging 16 points a game for us. And then team started scouting for him. And I, I tell all young players, this, the first time you get scouted is at the varsity level. JV coaches aren't, aren't watching film and, developing game plans against their their future opponents because guys don't even film those games um at the varsity level varsity coaches have film on you they're going to watch everything you do and they're going to take away what you're good at so after four games this kid was having a great year uh guys took away his shot and took away the open looks and knew the plays that he was going to get looks on and then he started forcing a little bit so you yeah. you you're you know you all kids are like this and uh, probably every basketball player is like this. You know, when you're not, when you're struggling and you, you want to do well for the team and as an individual, especially if you want to play at the next level, kids that want to play at the next level always are knowing how, how well they're playing. And he's one of these kids that wants to play at the next level. And he got into such a bad slump that it started to hurt us where it was like you're forcing shots that aren't good looks now because you're more concerned about film and how that's going to look to a, a college coach. Okay. Um, and I had to sit down and tell him this. 
Um, and he was a kid that is very hard on himself too. Those are the toughest ones to break out of a, out of a slump because they're talking to themselves so much in a negative aspect. I would take him out of a game after he, you know, he's been struggling. He goes right to the end of the bench and he's not mad at me. He's mad at himself. And he's talking about how bad he's playing, how, how things aren't going well, how we're, how we're losing this game because I'm missing a shot here, missing a shot there. So for me, this year was a lot of like sitting down with him and telling him you're a good shooter. It's just a slump. You got to go see the basketball, go in, try to get to the free throw line. And then the, the tough part was the previous coach would tell him to only shoot. So don't, don't do anything else, but shoot. I I'm a coach. That's you got to be multifaceted. You can't be yeah. a one dimensional player. So I'd be telling him, you got to, you know, put your head down and get to the rim once or twice. And it wasn't something he was comfortable doing because that's something he's never had to do. So that just comes into a whole like off season of you need to now be a better overall basketball player. Um, but for him, especially it was a lot of positive reinforcement. I've, I had my assistants have to talk to him because it's tough when it's only coming from you as the head coach of talking to players and trying to get them up. So sometimes your, your voice goes on deaf ears. Um, so luckily I, I had good assistant coaches that were good communicators and able to talk to our players when they did get into a slump uh, sometimes differently than I would do it, which was, which is always great when you have assistants who are comfortable doing things different than you would do it. It only makes your program better. You don't need a bunch of yes men in your in your program for for coaches. You need people that are going to challenge you a little bit. My assistants surely do, um, and it only helps your program. But um, the the other the other thing is in high school athletics that I think hurts a lot of kids mentally is the parents. You get parents who yeah. want to talk about what they feel like is going wrong, and sometimes that's completely opposite of what the coaching staff is saying. So we might be telling kids like, you know, you need to get in the gym, shoot a couple more shots in games. You got to get to the rim, see the ball go in, then, then start shooting threes, go inside out, get a couple layups, get, get your rhythm going that way. And their parents could be like, nah, just chuck up 10 threes in the game and just, just <laughs> do it that way. Um, so parent parents are tough on kids, especially parents who think their kids are, high level players, which, you know, we've all dealt with the parent that tells you, Oh, my kid's going to go play at this division one school. And you're like, absolutely not. They have no chance. You know, your kid's a five foot seven small forward. He's not playing at Duke. I hate to tell you. Um, but that that's another big aspect of it is, is the parents and the pressures the parents put on kids. Um, and I try to tell our team, like the only people you should be listening to about our program is the coaching staff and your peers that are the only people that's on your side. Um, but it is tough because I get them for two hours a day. The parents yep. get them for the other, you know, <laughs> seven hours they are not in school. So it, it's definitely a tough, and especially now where parents want basically 24 hour access to everything. Um, when their kids start to struggle, they'll be the first one to tell you about it and ask you why all these things are going wrong. Uh, I think communication is key with parents. So as long as you keep the parents up updated of how you feel you can get a kid out of a slump, I think they'll support you, but you know, you'll get those parents also that, you know, don't have your best interest at heart as a, as a coach. So it, it's definitely a hard part of the job. It's, it's uh, kind of like what you said about the, the job interview, right? You gotta, you gotta believe in, in what you're doing, believe yeah, in the things everything. that you're saying, right? Because yep. yeah, yeah, you'll get those, those confrontational uh, messages or get or get approached after a game by, by parents. So you gotta, you gotta believe in, in the process that you, that you have for sure. Um, I wanted to ask, cause I, I, I want to take a step back cause I, I'd completely forgotten to ask you this about where uh, shooting and, and where, you incorporate shooting into your practices. Does it evolve uh, throughout the season as your practices are going on? How do you intentionally work on making sure that uh, your guys are getting up meaningful shots during your practices and, and putting them intentionally into your practice plan? Yeah. So uh, it's funny. Um, 
because it's year one for me at mm-hmm. Algonquin, it's one of those things like one, you have to put in your, your offense, your defensive philosophies, your, your press, everything. Like you have to go, you're square one. So the first two weeks of the season is a lot of teaching, but at the same time, like you have to get these kids game ready. Uh, so we do a lot of shooting. Um, I would say shooting, you know, we, we do easily three shooting drills, a practice at minimum. I think you have to, you have to get these shots up, especially for the kids who aren't full-time basketball players who are three sport athletes and are kids you only see a couple months out of the year. You have to develop that skill set a little bit. So uh, we do we do a lot of shooting. In my perfect world, I got this from Tobin Anderson, uh, who's the head coach at Iona. Uh, he he has a system where every assistant coach has four kids that they are in charge of to get shots up before or after practice. And it's a whole, whole workout that they do because he says there's just not enough time when you have to teach everything uh, to get shots up all the time. So if, if I had my perfect world where I had access to the gym all the time, I'd have my, my two assistants have a group of four. I have a group of four get in there and shoot a lot. Uh, Obviously at the high school level, it's a lot harder to do that, but I hope eventually we get there. Um, Christmas break is a, is a big time for us shooting. We do, we try to get a hundred thousand shots up as a group during that week when we don't have school practices can go a little bit longer. Uh, a lot of shooting, a lot of shooting mm-hmm. during that time because you don't have as many games. Although we did have two games during our break this year. A lot of times I'll try to schedule games, not have games during pre- uh, Christmas break, just so uh, we can get a lot of shots up and kind of, kind of have a mini training camp. Because yeah. at, at the high school level, you don't get that with basketball, at least because tryouts are tryouts and it's a whole different atmosphere. Um, and then you go right into your season. And for us, I picked a team. My team was picked the Thursday, right? Yeah, four days. So the Thursday after we started tryouts, our first game was that next Friday. So a week <laughs> from that Friday, wow. I had a uh. So it was very, it's a very quick turnaround and it's a, it's a hard thing to do, um, especially year one. And you need to do all this stuff with shooting because you know, your team's not a great shooting team. So it's just, it's a lot when you, when you have such a quick turnaround. So we use Christmas to get, get some of that skill stuff, especially shooting done. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. And wow, what a what a quick turnaround you mentioned there. I that that's tough. <laughs> that's you know, you got to get in, you gotta get in in it right away. Um before we had our concluding segment, Coach, I did wanna I did wanna ask about, you know, you got you know, as, as you kind of we talked about uh earlier about, you know, guys wanna, you know, do all sorts of, you know, types of shots off one foot, turn around, spin, fade away, all, all these other all, all these other types of shots. Um for does that have any place at all? Is there even a time that you you want your guys working on there? Do you do you devote to any of that sort of stuff, or or are you are you sticking to the I guess the quote unquote tradition to traditional type shots? No, we work we work on uh, as I call it game move shots. So we we do a, a drill, very common drill. I think I've seen every college program I've ever sat in practice. They do this. I I call it three man two ball shooting. Um, so you have three, three players, two balls, and it's a, it's, we start catch and shoot, and then we use some dribble moves out of it. But a lot of the times I'll make up scenarios of what they have to do in the drill. So usually at the end, we'll do catch your, your pump faking, rip through two dribbles to the right spin move to a jump shot, just to give them some creativity off of it. Um, I change what, what dribble moves they're going to do and what they have to do with their shot. We've worked on the Dirk one legger before we've worked on, um, you know, a lot of different shots while their body is moving, because as much as I'm a firm believer of catch and shoot is the easiest shot to make 
in a basketball game with a lot of movement, guys are going to take shots that they're not stationary or the traditional shot, as you said. So you do have to work on that stuff. Now, we don't work on it getting a 100,000 of those shots up. But in the offseason, guys should be working on that type of shot because basketball is a game of movement. And you see the best players in the world are making those type of tough shots. But they're also working on those tough shots for hundreds of hours and perfecting that shot. They're not just shooting it because it was something that they saw in a YouTube video. They're working on it all the time. And I tell my players, if you work on it that much that you're going to be a 80% shooter taking that shot, I'll let you take it all day, but you have to work on it first. Yeah. It's, it's, there, there's definitely, as you, as you kind of alluded to, right. A, a, a proving time for that, right? Like there, there's a lot that you got to prove that you can, you got to prove you could do uh, other, other basic, more standard form shots before moving on to that. But yeah, to, to, to what you mentioned earlier, it's kind of funny to walk into a gym and see guys who are shooting up all kinds of stuff and, and, and crazy yep. leaners and turnarounds and fadeaways, but then they, they get into a position doing a, a stationary shot and, and they, they're, they're going two out of 10 or three out of 10 or something like that. Right. The more common shots they can hit because they don't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Coach, before we hit our concluding segment, because I know that there's a lot that, you know, uh, we, we covered, but I want to make sure was that was, was if there was anything else that you wanted to make sure that maybe you wanted to give to advices, uh, advice for coaches, anything else that you wanted to cover or touch on about shooting or that you think was really important that maybe you didn't get a, quite a chance to answer. I want to make sure I give you uh, that platform if there was anything you wanted to make sure that you covered. Uh, sure. In, in terms of shooting the basketball, I'm going to, for, for coaches out there, we're, we're kind of in this shooting era of, of basketball. Uh, the last 10 years or so, shooting the ball has become what dunking was in the 90s for little kids. Everybody wanted to dunk when I was growing up. Now everybody wants to shoot threes. Um, with that is going to come some hard times with a lot of different student athletes who are going to want to take tough shots. We as a, as a, as a coaching fraternity, as you will need to still teach the basics of shooting mm -hmm. and make sure kids are put in the right spot to shoot the basketball just because they see something on TV or a great player shooting it a certain way. It's still the guys who are the best shooters. They have very similar form to shooting. They get a, a similar lift. Ray Allen and Steph Curry, while do it, while being two of the greatest shooters to ever do it, they pretty much did it the same form throughout their careers and the same work ethic towards their shot. So the guys who are going to be great shooters are the guys who are taught the right way how to shoot the ball, not the guys who are just kind of put in one direction and told, like, shoot it this way, you'll be fine. We have to be we have to be hard on how we sh how we shoot or teach shooting nowadays because there is going to be so many different way ways of thinking of how to shoot the ball. But shooting the ball has been the same for a long time. If we continue to teach the fundamentals the right way, especially in this country where you know sh we're kind of we're getting caught with how we're teaching the game, the Europeans, I think teach basketball better than anybody shooting is a big reason for that. Um, if we do a better job teaching the fundamentals, the game will continue to grow immensely in this country as it has in prior generations. Love it. Well said coach to wrap up coach. I give guests two questions. First question, thinking back on your coaching career, what is a moment from your coaching career that you experienced that you went through that you think by telling it others listening would be able to learn from? Sure. Um, so I, 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 I talked about this individual at, at one point when mm -hmm. we talked about form shooting. Uh, I had a player in Sudbury who, um, again, I, I tell the story as he was five, he was five foot 10. He was an undersized center. He's probably closer to six, two, but I'm going to always go with five ten because it makes the story better. <laughs> um, he was an individual that I didn't know what he was going to be. He's, he was smaller, but he was a post player. He didn't handle the ball. Great. 
I really didn't even know if we had a chance, if he had a chance of making the team as a junior, he was a kid as a sophomore played on the, on the JV team. Um, and that kid, he was, he was tough. He gave everything he had. And when you have a player that's willing to work hard and to give it everything they got and has the ears to listen to what you're saying, I coached that kid harder than probably any kid I ever had. And he wasn't the best player I ever had. Uh, he certainly wasn't the most athletic player. He wasn't the biggest player. But he was the most important player I ever coached because I got to see as a young coach, when a kid has a determination to be good and wants to work at it, they're going to reach their potential with your help. So he's always somebody that I keep very close to my heart because he showed me that it's not always about talent and physical ability. Sometimes it's about the work ethic they're going to put in. And for me, if a kid's going to be willing to work, I'm going to be there to help them. And that's what that individual taught me. And I think that's made me a better coach uh, really since, since he graduated high school. Awesome. That, that, that's a great story. I, I love hearing about, you know, those players who uh, always stick with you. Right. And, and, and you can always look back at, you know, the experience you had working with them or, or think back to, as you mentioned, kind of the work ethic and the way that they carried themselves, the way that they practiced and played and just just know like that, that, that that was a success. That was a win, you know, for all the wins that we, you know, track on the, the standings and in the scorebook to have those sort of wins are, are I, I think lasts longer for me personally than, you know, any win or loss in a game. Absolutely. Absolutely. To wrap up coach, I give every guest what I call a, a 60 second soapbox, but you're welcome to go over 60 seconds. I'm not going to time you. Uh, it's your platform to kind of get out a uh, final thought, a final message, uh, something that you want to leave the listeners with. You, you could take it any direction that you want. Uh, basketball or coaching or otherwise. So uh, it's your soapbox, Coach. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to you and and let you take the floor from here. Sure. So I'll just I'll just talk about what year one as a as a varsity coach, what I learned and things that I will uh, take with me going forward. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to be a varsity coach really since I was done playing the game um, after college and. Uh, when I was 22, 23, right out of college thought I knew everything about the game and, and I, how I'd be a great coach. And I was lucky enough to work under a guy for 10 years and Mike Norman, who taught me a lot. Um, but when, when you finally get in, in control and you get that phone call that says you're, you're our guy to run our varsity program. Uh, it's kind of like the umbilical cord being being cut because now it, it's up to you and you're running the program. And my first year, I'll tell you, uh, make friends in your league, uh, especially if it's a new league. For me, it was a, a brand new league. Uh, I had never even played any teams in this league. So I had I had to really network and figure out like who who can help me in this league, who's going to be willing to film share and who's going to be willing to share scouting reports with me. Um, also, it, it comes down to you. There's uh, Every loss is the coach's fault and every win is the player's success. So uh, if you're not able to take that heat, uh, it, it's going to be a tough profession to be in. Um, every loss, there's going to be somebody that uh, has something to say or thinks you could have done this or run a different play or, or done a different defense. Again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, always be able to, to defend your philosophy of the game. If you're not able to do that as, as a head coach, you, you're probably not ready to be a head coach. Um, your players, there's going to be players that love you. There's going to be players that are, are okay with you. And then there's going to be players that, you know, probably wish there was somebody else as a coach. It's another thing that you have to get used to in this game. Not everybody's going to be your best friend. Not every kid's going to think you're the greatest coach of all time. And it's just part of the game. Uh, it's part of our profession as coaches. And um, I think those are three things you have to learn right away when you're a first-year varsity coach. 
or a first year coach anywhere. You have to find, yep. you have to find these things to help you. And, uh, you know, it, it's a coaching is a thankless job. <laughs> you know, they'll thank you at the banquet and, uh, that's really about it. But unless you're winning the state championship, there's always going to be somebody that thinks they could have done a better job too. Uh, there's always somebody in the community that thinks they could do your job. Uh, so watch out who you tell, tell things to, because there's always somebody lurking and there's somebody that wants your job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, very well said those, those words, right. Uh, you never know who, 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 who you're talking to in some cases and who that word or who that message gets out to. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that, that, uh, you know, you want to, want to keep your words as like that old adage, keep your words soft and sweet in case you have to eat them later sort of thing. So yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Great advice too, that you shared on uh, for, for new coaches or first year coaches who, who might be jumping right in. Uh, Coach Stockton, really appreciate you coming on and, and, and talking about shooting, talking about offense, talking about interview process, all that really good stuff. Um, really excited for you to get a, a full proper summer and full proper off season to work with your guys, getting, getting them more shots up, building and expanding on your offense and hopefully having a great season. So again, appreciate it coach and best of luck next year. Yeah. Thank thank you for this. It's a great platform. And uh, uh, I really uh, look forward to uh, everything that, that you have to bring out to us. I enjoy every episode. Thank you. And thank you so much for listening guys. This was another edition of the basketball teacher podcast. We will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.